But first, here's my take. As he moves on to his fourth national security advisor in less than three years, it's become clear that Donald Trump's foreign policy is in shambles. It has produced turmoil, but achieved almost nothing. Despite all the boasts, there are no new deals with China, Iran, North Korea, the Taliban, or between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Just uncertainty, disappointment, and lots of bruised feelings. Trump informed the world that he was a great deal maker. Yet other than minor changes to NAFTA and the U.S.-Korean trade pact, he has achieved little. There are many reasons for this. The Trump administration has been chaotic and undisciplined, bringing the ethos of a mom-and-pop real estate shop to one of the world's largest and most complex institutions, the United States federal government. The central problem, however, is that Trump is a bad negotiator. With both Kim Jong-un and the Taliban, he gave away crucial leverage right from the start. The North Koreans have wanted one-on-one -on -one meetings with the U.S. president for decades. Trump gave away that prize right away, hoping to charm Kim into giving up his nuclear weapons. So far, Kim won, Trump zero. With Afghanistan, Trump excoriated President Obama for announcing deadlines for troop withdrawals. And yet, he's done something similar, repeatedly announcing his eagerness to quit, and then being surprised that the Taliban sought to press its advantage. Consider Trump's muddle on Afghanistan. He fired John Bolton, apparently, because Bolton objected to making a deal with the Taliban, except that Trump then canceled talks with the Taliban, effectively agreeing with Bolton. Anyway, with Bolton gone, Trump does have the opportunity to act on his instincts and get something, a new Iran deal. Let's face it, his re-imposition of sanctions on Iran has been surprisingly, brutally effective. But Iran is a proud ancient civilization and a canny regional power. It will not simply surrender. It might agree to a new deal, one that achieves more than the Obama Accord. But for this to work, Trump will have to overrule some of his most hawkish advisors and find a path to a real negotiation. The Iranians will likely sit down only if sanctions are suspended during the negotiations. They will want to describe any changes that are made as additional measures to implement the existing deal rather than a new deal. Whatever, that's what diplomats are there for. Trump's goal should be to get the Iranians to agree to extend the time horizon of key parts of the deal by approximately five years. He will not be able to make much headway on Iran's ballistic missiles. Iran views them as its defense against the vast Saudi military. On Iran's other regional activities, its support for Hezbollah, for example, it might well be willing to talk, but Trump will have to consider whether this would extend the negotiations into an interminable conversation involving Israel and the broader Middle East. Most important, to get an Iran deal, Trump would have to work against his fundamental urge always to claim total victory. Maybe that works in business, where there are single transactions, though it may explain why so few business people ever do business with Trump again. Anyway, foreign policy is not about solo transactions. It's about long-term relationships. Both sides have their own domestic politics and constituencies. Each needs to be able to say it has achieved success. If Trump can stomach that, he could emerge with something rare in his tenure so far, an actual foreign policy win. For more, go to CNN.com slash Fareed and read my Washington Post column this week. And let's get started. The decision of British voters to leave the European Union will have vast consequences for Britain, for Europe, and for the world. Those were the words of Britain's former Prime Minister, Tony Blair, published in the New York Times in June of 2016, the day after the British people elected to leave the European Union. Blair said he felt great personal and political sadness over the decision. Today, three years and three months later, there is perhaps even more reason for sadness. Britain is in total political turmoil. Some say its worst crisis in its modern history. To help us make sense of it, 
I'm joined by the author of those words, Tony Blair. Welcome. Thanks, Fried. Um, for all of us outside of Britain, for the world, what is going on? What is the big pictures here? What are we to make of the last few weeks? Well, I was kind of hoping you wouldn't ask me to, <laughs> to, to explain it because it's extremely difficult to explain. But essentially, I think what has happened now is that there is a complete blockage in Parliament um, because the government is now wanting to do Brexit even with no agreement, no deal, as it were, with the European Union about the future, uh, or indeed any agreement as to the terms of Britain's withdrawal from Europe. Parliament is against that. Parliament's blocked. And I think the big picture is there's now an acceptance you've got to go back to the people to break the deadlock. In other words, ask them what they mean. Do they really want to go forward with this more extreme form of Brexit? Um, and now the issue is, do you do that through a general election, which is the preference of the government, or do you do it in a specific referendum, which personally I would think is a much more sensible way of dealing with it. But so you've got blockage, you've got the acceptance that the people are the right way to break the blockage, and the question is then, what's the means? And so why is Boris Johnson trying to do this in the, in, by, by triggering a general election rather than a referendum? Well, that's a very uh, good and pertinent question. I think the reason is essentially political. Um, he believes that if you look at the opinion polls, the Labour Party leader, Jeremy Corbyn, is very weak in the polls. Labour is still really not doing what you'd expect an opposition party with this turmoil to be doing. And so he thinks if you have a general election, then he can mask the unpopularity of a no-deal Brexit by pointing to the, the, the greater unpopularity of the Labour leadership. That's one... Um, bet that I think he's making. But the other thing is, un under our political system, we have first passed the post in constituency. So it's the person with the most votes. The Conservative and pro-Brexit forces probably will be reasonably united. They won't get, I don't think, above 40%. They may get less than that. But the opposition is then severely divided in each constituency between the Labour Party and then the third party, which is the Liberal Democrats, or Scottish Nationalists and others, who've got more or less the same position on Brexit, but very different mm -hmm. positions on the general election issue. So that's why um, there is a political advantage, if you like, in trying to do this in a general election. Though I have to say, in these last couple of weeks, the government itself has been acting in quite an extreme way, proroguing Parliament, expelling long-standing conservative members of parliament from the party, going for this no deal Brexit, whatever the cost. And, you know, it's, I would have thought it's quite an uncertain bet, actually, even for the conservatives now. So for all of those reasons, in my view, if you've got a problem and the problem is Brexit, and you want to ask the public, what does it think, go back to them on the specific. Don't mix it up with the general election. But that's where I think the debate is going to be in the next few weeks. Tony, what if you get your wish and there is a second referendum? and the public votes to leave again, because there is some evidence. For, yes. First of all, Britain has long had an awkward relationship with Europe, uh, but also there's this feeling, uh, let's rip the bandage and get it done with. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And if that happens, then that's an end of it. Uh, you know, I've said to people, and I mean it, you can't carry on <laughs> with this. And by the way, the overwhelming, the only thing that unites the British people at the moment is a desire to have the thing over with. Um, so if there was another referendum and people voted to leave, well, you'd just have to accept that result and make the best of it. I'm not sure they would. And one of the reasons for the reluctance of the arch Brexiteers to have another say with the British people is, I think, an underlying anxiety that when we look at it, we'll realise that, you see, leaving Europe's not the answer to any of Britain's problems. I mean, most of the big decisions about Britain are made in Britain. They're not made in Brussels. On our healthcare system, on our education system, whether we put our taxes up, whether we spend more money, how we reform our welfare or pensions, law and order, defence, war and peace, they're all decisions made in Britain. So the Brexit thing is really part of this populist movement across the Western world, where in, in the face of big challenges, people look for someone to blame. They look to ride the anger, not provide the answer, and that's the problem.